Hey, pull up a chair. It's Hacks on Tap with David Axelrod, Robert Gibbs, and Mike Murphy. Raleigh, Saginaw, Milwaukee, Phoenix, Vegas, Hotlanta, the Philly suburbs, Manchester, Dallas, and Houston. Donald Trump, as far as we can tell, has just been trying to win a third championship at his own golf course. My question to you, sir, can voters trust a presidential candidate who has not won a single Trump International Golf Club trophy? At long last, sir, have you no chip shot? Well, look, I'd be happy to play. I told him this before when he came into the Oval when he was being, before he got sworn in. I said, I'll give you three strokes if you carry your own bag. All right, Murphy, there you go. You know, the comic stylings of Bobo yes. Biden there, working the main room in New York City, gold yeah. material. Radio City Music Hall. Oh, Radio yeah. City Music Hall. I'm waiting to see him at the Laugh Stop in uh, Columbus. But, you know, I, I like it anytime Biden gets off a good joke at Trump's expense because you're always making a 50 50 bet that Trump will explode and do something crazy because he has, as we've discussed, no sense of humor. But speaking of no sense of humor, we wanted to go in the opposite yes. direction today with a very funny man, uh, a political expert, a well-known international media celebrity, dog owner, uh, and a pretty good polka singer. Little secret, the one and only John Heilman. Johnny, ah. welcome. Does anybody say singing polka? Is that actually a thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? There's money. I there. want to say, you know, hey, Murphy, you'll be happy to know. How do you think about Murphy? It. How do you think Murphy got through college? <laughs> that was, uh, well, I, I actually know that Murphy didn't get through college. That's the answer. <laughs> Barely through high school. Hey, um, uh, thanks for having me on, you guys. It's great to be here. And I will say, Murphy, just to your to please you, um, I'm, yeah, my lease on my current car is just uh, coming to an end, and I'm going EV, baby. Oh wow! Just because of Murphy? No, not because of Murphy. Murphy's got nothing to do with despite it. Despite Murphy, <laughs> despite, despite well, we're Murphy. gonna one, we're gonna talk to you. Got to go to evpolitics.org and load up on merch. I'll give you the secret code. Fantastic. Got great Christ. stuff there. The, the, the slave labor in China has been working hard. Uh, on it's our like new working line. with Donald Trump. It's like working with Donald <laughs> yeah. Trump here. He's always we don't got do gold to sneakers, sell. though, though. I'm getting a bit. I'm getting a bit. <laughs> Does anybody else get a little squirrely when you hear, like, I mean, Biden, I like it when, he, when he's funny about Trump, but like the golf jokes? I don't know. It's just no, it's somehow true. Like, it's just it's bums very me out. So like, I'll spot you three strokes up, y'all. If you carry your bag, I'm like, I, 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 have a, I have a question about the whole deal at Radio City Music Hall. I mean, everybody. You know, it was treated sort of like a message event. It obviously wasn't because none of it was uh, shared except for a few bites like the one I just shared with you. Uh, but, you know, a glitterati at Radio City Music Hall is not necessarily helpful in general. Forget the golf uh, jokes. But $26 million is. Yeah, no, they're doing great on that. But a question on the event, was this the three presidents thing? Was that at Radio City yes, or was that, yeah, that something was else? Yeah. The three presidents. Okay, yeah, how'd they yeah, peel Clinton yeah. off the Rockettes? But I guess we, we're, that's a whole nother topic. Uh, I knew that oh, was coming. Oh, it's easiest setup Man. in the world. Come on. Come on. I couldn't resist. <laughs> I know. That's why I knew it was coming. There we go. Here all week. Tip your server. <laughs> so is it a win? I think it was a win. It was a money win. He got off the sound bite joke. But was it the message event of the century? And was the venue right? I, I, I agree with you. A little inelegant, but I take the cash. Yeah, no. But my point is, my point, I guess I was leading into a question. He is crushing Trump on money. And how much does that matter? I have, you know, Pluff was down here with uh, Carl Rove and we did a thing at Arizona State University. And Pluff uh, argued that the money means less in a presidential race, which is true when both candidates are very well known. It, that was his argument, when both candidates are universally known. But there was a piece down here in Arizona last uh, week that Trump has virtually nothing going on the ground because the state party is shattered. They have no money. Yep. Trump has no money. I think in these battleground states, that kind of stuff has to matter. Johnny, you want to grab that one and then I'll bloviate? Well, look, I would say here. All of a sudden here, he's I'll, polite. No, all the all the following things are true, right? No, one, one. Back when, back when Bar I remember the good old days. Back when Barack Obama would host his, would have his Jeffrey Katzenberg fundraisers. There would never be like rock cats or anything else. They'd be hidden away somewhere in the hills and the, in the Holmby Hills. Nobody would know who all the people were at the uh, at the uh, Obama fundraiser. You never were like, hey, let's go to Hollywood and do a big fundraiser with Jeffrey Katzenberg and, and like tr <laughs> trot that out because that's always right, good exactly. for your image as in middle America. Um, but I do think the, the the numbers were a flex, right? I mean, you could, to do an event like that. That, what struck me was it's like 
It's it's March. Three presidents on stage together in March, not like in October of a presidential right. year. Like, hey, let's get all three of them together and like and like kind of trying to rub Trump's nose in the fact that he's so broke. Um, that to me was the message of it, which was, yeah, fuck you. We can keep doing this all day long or we're going to keep raising more money. And we're going to crush you. And I do think Pluff is right, though. The, 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 you guys are all right. Look. The advertising thing isn't going to matter. You should be in politics. You know, everybody knows Trump. Everybody knows Biden. What are you going to do? Right? I mean, it's great to. Re- it's really important to remind people that Trump is a lunatic, and they're doing a pretty good job of that. I think of kind of make taking people back to four years ago and showing them what it was actually like when Trump was president. They got to keep reminding people of how bad it was. So having money on hand to do that is good. They're not going to change anyone's perception of Trump because the perceptions are all baked in. But man, in these battleground states where like where he won by tens of thousands of votes, the margins are so thin that on the ground game, the yeah. money totally matters. Yeah, that that's my view. I, I think in the big picture, yeah, it's not the decisive thing, but Biden is not exactly the political home run king. So being able to bunt a lot <laughs> is important. And having the money advantage, which may really count to David's point this time, because Trump is kind of like a guy with a really good, high-paying job who happens to be a heroin addict on the side. So all the money is is going to the needle, which is the legal stuff. I mean, they have uh, Dracula could not have drained more stuff out of the RNC than they have. There's a good New York Times story on it today. And half this, well, not half, but a significant percentage of the key state parties um, are now essentially run by people with aluminum foil Napoleon costumes. So they, the Trump guys have real problems there and no dough. So I think, it, although he, I think Pluff's right in the big picture, it's not a small thing. And, and because of Trump's weakness, it just becomes an even bigger thing. So, yeah, yeah they get points for it. And they're going to need it because they're the other stuff they're not doing so well. So they got to overachieve in some areas. And looks like money is going to be one of the big ones. I love the bunting thing, breaking it out. Unlike the opening week of the baseball season, oh, Murphy showing God. unsuspected oh. cultural awareness. Not um, my first my... rodeo, boys. I started <laughs> out in radio in 1979. <laughs> Isn't there also, there's also a kind of a psychological element to it because of the many things that make Trump crazy. The idea that Trump would be like, like outspent by Joe Biden, that like Joe Biden could like put yeah. on, you know, it makes Trump crazy. That he doesn't have any celebrities. He, he made him crazy in 16. It's not just the money. It's not there's just a, the There's money. a psyops element to this. Shunned in Manhattan by the elites is something that that bothers Trump. Yeah, I you know you got. I wonder if they're sitting down with sort of uh, psyops people talking about like how do you get inside of Trump's head and they should. If that was the purpose, then his Easter weekend barrage of tweets or whatever they call them on Truth Social uh, suggests that maybe they're scoring some pay dirt here because he is absolutely. He went batshit crazy yep. over the weekend, as he often does, by the way, on holiday weekends. You notice that <laughs> totally, Christmas, totally. Yeah. Easter. Well, he's sitting alone with no crowd in a in a hockey arena, loving him, and you know, just the the rage, and you know, reading the divorce letters from Melania that haven't come public or whatever. Uh, he's just a lonely man. I think he may. I think he may be jealous of Christ and the Christ getting all that attention. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. Or, or as he would say, the other Christ. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, <laughs> the other Messiah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the imitator. Biden is creeping up and it, it's not, it's marginal. This is going to be a marginal race all the way, but he is ticking up from where he was at his nadir kind of in December and January. Uh, And the question is, and we've talked about this before, Heilman, does the general election spotlight on Trump hurt Trump? I mean, you know, he's been communicating uh, to his base for the last so often, uh, so, so, uh, so many months. Does the fact that he's now getting general election attention actually help Biden? Well, I certainly can't. It certainly doesn't hurt Biden, right? I mean, the thing about Trump is that, you know, you guys remember this back in 2020, you know, we all used to say, well, Trump's not communicating to, he's not trying to win over anybody he, he didn't, who didn't vote for him in 2016. And they would say in response, the Trump campaign would say, yeah, that's not what we're doing. We're trying to find a bunch of voters, millions of voters who didn't vote in 2016 and are Trump friendly. And if we can turn those people out, we're going to get more votes. And it turned out they were right. They got, they increased, they, they enrolled, their broad vote total went up. They found a bunch of those people, tens of millions of them who were basically Trump MAGA people who just hadn't bothered to vote in 2016. 
I just don't see how that's a deep well they can draw from this time. So you really are back in this kind of more general election mode. And the question is, this goes back to the thing about reminding people about how bad Trump was or how offensive he was to their values, is it goes back to these these people who are, you know, traditional swing voters, people in this in the suburbs in these battleground states. And I just, you know, the, the for a lot of those people, they have been, I mean, we know no one's watching. Everyone has turned off politics. Everyone hates this race. The network re- ratings are down. Uh, there's no Trump bump. Everyone is like thoroughly like, oh, God, when am I going to have to actually tune into this thing? I don't want to tune into this thing. You're, most Democrats, most Republicans, just I, I will tune in eventually. I will vote eventually. But just I like as defer this pain as long as possible. And it does feel to me like that the reality is that for some of those people who just want to switch it off for as long as possible, when we start to get to the place where they can't anymore and they start to really focus in their minds again about about how just fucked up Trump is, that that will be a benefit to Biden. And again, on the margin, all these things are going to be on the margin, as you said, David, it's going to be a margin of error race to the last day. I think that's probably right. But my, I have the constant worry of every week at the Biden campaign, hey, Trump's getting more attention. Hey, we landed a good hit. All, all helpful. And at the end, the country said, oh, boy, that Trump. And they fire Biden because they want to fire Biden. So the hard meeting at the Biden campaign is not how do we screw Trump, just give him a microphone. It's how do we try to help Biden? And, you know, that that's the heavy lift because Biden is not that good at helping Biden. And, you know, I know it's on our discussion list, but the economic message is not what it needs to be for an incumbent president in trouble to get reelected. I want to park the marginal voter question for a second because it, it comes back to something else that Biden said. But a lot of the target of the barrage this weekend of Trump's was also generated not just by Radio City Music Hall, but something more significant, which was that he now knows he's going to trial on April 15th in New York. And a lot of the attention was focused on the judge and the judge's daughter, who apparently is some sort of uh, message digital strategist consultant. or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, you know, so he's trying to make the case that the judge is hopelessly biased because his daughter is a political consultant. But the main thing he's doing, guys, the and, and, and it was outrageous because he put a target on the young woman's back. And you know, now the, the judge has imposed a gag order that extends to family members of people involved in the case. The big point here is Trump does what Trump does, which is that he brands these things in advance. Before the election in 2020, he was branding the thing as as corrupt. So if he lost, which he did, uh, he could say that it was uh, stolen. He, he does these things. And now he's trying to brand this trial because I think he fears that he is going to lose. This is the Stormy Daniels uh, hush money case. Trial hush money case in in New York. Oftentimes, you know, we focus on the outrageousness of what Trump does, but we don't focus on the sort of strategic, uh, whatever. Whether it's it's probably instinctive more than strategic thinking of what he does. But he is trying to brand this trial in advance, so that if it goes south on him, he can uh, claim that the whole thing was fixed and uh, a sham. Yeah, he tries to preemptively disqualify things, anything, you know, crooked Joe's rig trial. So nothing is legitimate but him. He's the only radio station. And it gives his people an easy handle. Oh, the trial's rigged. You know, it's always a preemptive brand. And it works pretty well for him. And, you know, part of it is he has a big hunk of vote, not a majority, though, that, you know, wants a party line. So he he does. He kind of operates like an old school Bolshevik, to be honest. It's all the same stuff. I don't think I'm alone uh, among people who think that uh, Trump facing legal accountability is an important thing for uh, the future of American democracy, for our rule of law, and 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 obviously in the case of this uh, this campaign. But I don't think I'm alone in thinking. God, it would be really. I really wish that this was not the this was not the trial. Yeah, of course. You know, that that, yeah, that this exactly. is that. What is, you know, to go back to the marginal voter. Trump's people are all going to see this as it's easy for him to say black DA right. biased judge. New this York is just more city jury. The, New York City. Democrat this is just daughter, more, New York City. Right. 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 This is just more persecution for me. I'm a martyr. They're all out to get me, just like they're out to get you. You know that that's easy with his voters. Does does the does suburban housewives outside Philadelphia uh, or down David in Arizona where you are? Do they look at that and go? You know, Stormy Daniels, hush money, this is a bullshit case? Or do people think, 
business fraud. You know, this is a serious thing. 34 counts. He should go to jail. No, I've been saying for a long time that if you have to combine the words porn star and novel legal theory in the same sentence, you ought to think about whether you should uh, bring the case. But uh, one interesting thing. That- Either one of those on its own, though, is fine. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the th- one, one of the things that uh, struck my eye this morning was that there's a report that Hope Hicks is going to testify for the prosecution at the trial. His old sort of public relations, you know, uh, person who is very, very close to him. Um, and the whole Trump argument in that trial is that he he didn't hide these payments Uh, to Stormy Daniels because he didn't because of the campaign that he did it because he didn't want to embarrass his family, which on the face (laughs) of it is kind of an absurd argument. So the whole of the last eight years knocks that down. Like if you're not trying to embarrass your family, there's like, oh, there's something that happens almost every day. That you but she, have she could specifically knock it down if she, if she says, you know what, he was really concerned about that if that story came out before the election, after the Access Hollywood tape, that uh, that could sink him. And so he was very interested in keeping it from being publicized. That would be pretty bad for him. I think so. It would light up true social. Talk about angry, bitter, heartbroken Trump. But the problem is, to, you know, what the average Trump, you know, voter supporter will think, and, and this is the kind of sloganeering within it in our postmodern era, they just quote the, the banner that probably ran over the DNC across top of the building in the 90s. It's only sex. So if it's only sex and it was okay for Bill Clinton, who didn't go to jail, why should Donald Trump? Because the system is rigged. And, you know, kind of an ironic twist, but it's the same defense and everything in politics has some symmetry to it. So, yeah, I think none of this is good for Trump, uh, but I'm not sure it's killing for Trump. I agree with Heilman that, that this is the, this, if you, if I'm sure that no one on the Biden side you know, for all this bullshit of Trump's that Biden is orchestrating all this, you would not orchestrate this as the first trial he faces. No, Trump would. Just, just a little bit of public service uh, 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 message here for your listeners. When Murphy said there was a banner over the DNC that said it's only sex in the 1990s, that actually that there was not a banner over the DNC. That oh, said of course it's only not. Sex. I'm arguing by exaggeration, but it was the mantra. In case anyone's confused about that, it just came out as a little. We bit have like, a highly educated audience of political hacks, fixers, and I thought you other, guys were going like I thought you guys had gone single. mainstream. I thought this is like the who told list Heilman of political... that he was the fact checker here? Yeah, exactly. Okay, save it for Rogan. I've heard you guys. I've heard you, I've heard you guys are like the smart list of, of political consultants. Let's stop for a minute and listen to a word from one of our fine sponsors. So we all know David Axelrod, the political legend, but eh, I just happen to know you're also the legend of Rush Street in Chicago. How do you keep up with the young kids on those late nights in your favorite town? Well, I do enjoy a good night out every once in a while, my friend. And being a Murphy, I think you understand that. I'll tell you what, it works out better for me now because I found Z-Biotics. Yeah, you know what Z-Biotics is? I know a bunch of PhD scientists cooked it up, so it, it's not some out-of-work chiropractor playing pharmacy here. No, no, it's a Z-Biotics is a pre-alcohol probiotic drink, the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. And oh. Murphy, here's how it works. I've looked into this. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct. You, you know, I always thought it was dehydration, but it's not. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's that toxic byproduct in your gut that's to blame for your rough next day. Well, Zbiotics produces this enzyme to break this byproduct down. And you, the whole deal is you just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night, drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. You know, I did hear about this because we got an email from one of our listeners down at Miami Beach uh, on, a, on a weekend uh, celebrating. Yeah. I won't go into details, but they they sent us a little testimonial. They heard about Zbiotics on our podcast. 
they tried it out and it really, really worked. So I've got some here and uh, I'm going to find the appropriate weekend to give it the kind of rigorous lab testing that we do. But uh, this stuff, we're getting great feedback on it. If it passes your lab test, Murphy, we know it works. So you go to zbiotics.com slash hacks to get 15% off your first order when you use hacks at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, Murphy, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. I like these guys. So remember, head to zbiotics.com slash hacks and use the code hacks at checkout for 15% off. Remember to always drink responsibly. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and our good times. Something happened yesterday that uh, was interesting. Uh, the the uh, Florida Supreme Court issued a series of decisions, one of which mm. was uh, essentially upholding the six-week abortion ban in Florida, which seems bad for the Republican Party generally. Um, and obviously, uh, Trump feels that way because he was very critical of the six-week uh, abortion ban, but they also put an abortion rights initiative on, on the, the ballot. ballot. Yeah, along with, by the way, in anticipation of Heilman reaching his retirement age and moving down there, a legalized marijuana uh, thing on the ballot down there as well. Uh, so, uh, which all of which should s- sort of change the nature of turnout down there, Murphy. You're a Florida hand. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, it's uh, this one really got on my radar because in 16, Florida was was pretty tight, uh, but Dade County totally collapsed for the Democrats. And part of that was sending Kamala Harris down to a, a, a county during kind of a perfect storm with male Latinos, the Venezuelan issue and everything. And the, the Democrats in Florida just have not been that good. You know, it's one of their weaker operations. The Washington generals have offered them some tips, and that would probably improve things. But this this could put Florida in semi-play, which is another resource drain. So back to the money thing we opened with, the Dems can afford to go sink real dough in there uh, and try to light it on fire. And the Trump campaign, it's a resource drain. They're not really ready for it. It's another wobbly state party. You know, I would give Trump the advantage there. The state's been moving in a Trumpy direction, but this issue has power. It'll be on the ballot. So I think Florida goes into the interesting column now. It also forces Trump, who's a voter in the state of Florida, to take a position, to say whether he's going to support the thing or not. And it puts him right back in the middle of a issue he doesn't want to have anything to do with. He's just going to attack Meatball Ron for that six-week abortion. Ah, that's, a re- that's a Meatball Ron idea. I'm not into it. I don't like it at all. It's stupid. No VP for you. But the initiative itself is, I, I think, tr- uh, a problematical for him. Go ahead, John. 100%. The, the, Barack Obama wins uh, wins Florida by three in 2008, wins by one in 2012. Hillary loses it by one in, to Trump in 2016, and, uh, and Biden loses it by three in, in 2020. Like Florida is like getting redder and redder. Not trending, and, yeah, not trending in the in the blue yeah, direction. In the, right, in the right direction. And so I don't think it'd be in the Biden campaign today. Says you know this is now a battleground. No, state. no. I do think that people in the, in the Biden campaign are going to watch it pretty carefully. And to Murphy's point, spend a little money down there, make Trump you know be worried about it. If you get to September and the thing is getting it's tighter one more and reason tighter, having more money is helpful. Exactly. And and if the thing is getting tighter and tighter, then you can start to really and you have still have that big financial advantage. You can really do some. You can really mess around down there and. And the two big trends in that state, and I'm not from Florida, and I will never live there in retirement, no matter whether they legalize weed or not. It, but it's <laughs> the two biggest trends are what's what's happened is is that it, we have they're colliding, right? Which is Trump's strength with Latinos is real. It's the reason why he that the whole difference between being Hillary by one and, and Biden by yeah. three has been the collapse of Hispanic support, right? Uh, exactly, and, right. especially in Florida. So you've got one trend line, which is that Trump is riding that wave of of increased Latino support, and then you've got the, the what really is the truism of our time, which is anytime the abortions on the ballot, Democrats have benefited, and that forget about what the polling shows. It, every you know from Kansas on, yeah, yeah, we've yeah. just seen it. So it's like you've got abortion. Abortion politics playing for Democrats. You've got Latino ethnic politics playing up for Trump's case. Probably it still means Florida's out of reach for Biden. But I can imagine you look up in September and we go, 
uh, hold on a second here. This thing's like really in play. And, and the Dems can afford a $70 million bet there to light the yes. place on fire. And that is a strategic move that's smart. We've talked about this before, but uh, this is not the only state where there is uh, an initiative or potentially an initiative on the ballot. Uh, right. d- uh, Democrats are fighting hard to get the initiative on the ballot in Nevada, in Arizona. They're going to need it. They're going to need it in Nevada. No question. No question about it. Uh, and look, this is one of the issues that will have real appeal to younger voters uh, who are not very motivated right now uh, uh, and certainly and certainly not trending uh, in the way that Biden needs them to trend. There's anger about a lot of issues, economic issues about the war. Uh, but this is one that really does uh, rally them. By the way, uh, Biden uh, posted a, an ad this morning that we uh, that is right on this point. It's very strong. Because for 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. In 2016, Donald Trump ran to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, in 2024, he's running to pass a national ban on a woman's right to choose. I'm running to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again, so women have a federal guarantee to the right to choose. Donald Trump doesn't trust women. I do. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. That's a pretty straightforward, yeah, very yeah. straightforward, right at him, using his own voice, comparative, Murphy. It's a contrast. This is like right down Main Street. Yeah. It's a good play. I'll take the contrarian point on one part of it, though. Yeah. I love it to set Florida fire on fire. It's great in Nevada, uh, a, a, another state where it's on the ballot. You can overestimate the power of the abortion issue in Michigan and Wisconsin and to some extent Georgia. Um, still a winner, but not quite the sledgehammer. People forget. I mean, you won't because you know you started with uh, with Wilson, but Michigan was uh, the a very strong Democratic pro life yeah. state, kind of like Pennsylvania. Some of that's still there, so it's a it's a double there, not a home run. Look at the midterms in yeah, Michigan. Yeah, no, I agree. I've, I've, they I've had it, at it on the all. ballot. Yeah, Gretchen yeah. Whitmer wins by ten over ten points there for yes. governor. And they get the constitutional thing yeah, there yeah, too. Yeah, but it was a lot more than abortion with her. She's she's got a lot of. Uh, so my, my but point all is, the candidates did well. All the Democrat candidates did well. It, it is a cushion for Dems, and in the upper Midwest, it's not as strong in a presidential race. In Michigan, it's the reason that Dems took over for the first time in forty years both chambers of the legislature right, right. In, in a midterm. Third less turnout. Well, they also it wasn't it also the constitution. They also got a constitutional. Didn't they also change yeah. the Michigan state constitution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, no, it's the majority thing, right? position. Yeah. But I'm telling you, yeah. the, the Dems are clinging to this thing. Like Biden's age doesn't matter. We we have this issue, and well, I'm just foolish. saying it can be yeah. overrated. In those states, it's not overrated in many other, in most states. I agree. Let me ask you one question about this Democratic turnout. Democratic turnout has been. Uh, disproportionately good. Democrats have been on a real roll since the midterms in special elections and regular since Dobbs, elections. Since Dobbs. Right, since Dobbs, yes. I always say that the two most valuable players for Democrats are Donald Trump and Sam- Samuel Alito. But you get to the, the question that hasn't been answered is, can you uh, extrapolate from what's gone on in these elections to a general presidential election? It used to be that's the key. It used to be that Republicans had an advantage in these elections because highly educated well-to-do voters came out in greater numbers than uh, than what was then the Democratic base. Now the bases have sort of flipped. Flipped, yeah. So the question is, does that trend hold in a general election? Or do the more culturally conservative downscale voters who show up favor Trump not as worried? But I don't say that's such a funny thing, though, because, of course, in the midterms is when we normally think about that low turnout elections will always favor Republicans. And I just I feel like the Dobbs thing is is not as Murphy, to your point, I'm not sitting here saying no, Joe Biden's age is an issue and this will be the silver bullet and it's all fine. Democrats will be Joe Biden's got it in the bag. But I do think that we, we've seen 
Yeah, and I was one of those people who, after Dobbs, was like, I have no idea what's going to happen. We've never seen anything like this before. A right taken away. Will people mobilize? Will people turn out? I don't have any idea. But in like every in every time it's been a test, every time it's been a test of it in every state, red states, blue states, purple states, it's the, it's been a giant motivator. And I just there's not been a contrary piece of evidence. We don't know what will happen in this general election, but there's not been one thing you can point to where the power of Dobbs has not been greater than expected. By Agreed. even people who are even people who thought it would change a lot are still kind of like blown away by how much it's changed. The whole question is the new factor, Biden, who they want to fire on the ballot. That's the only new factor. And is that big enough to partially eclipse it or not? I, I think it will eclipse it. The question is to what degree. But it's net net a plus for the Dems on every level and almost every place. By the way, this Florida ruling, which will have reverberations in other states on the six-week ban, is going to reignite the issue again. Uh, The Supreme Court has some matters in front of it that could uh, as well. But listen, you guys talk about these voters who are disinterested uh, right now, not engaged, uh, uh, generally uh, uh, economically uh, on lower economic rungs uh, and so on. These voters, I mean, poll after poll after poll suggests that the economy is really a big issue for them. I want to play something that just it just drives me nuts. And I'm going to say it every week until the president, who's an avid listener of this podcast, finally (laughs) gets the message. Uh, Here here he is. He did a little interview with Al Roker on NBC on the Today Show yesterday uh, for the Easter egg hunt at the White House. And Roker asked a pretty simple, direct question question and listen to the president's answer when people are saying you know but mr president i'm feeling i'm i'm feeling uh, you know my my buck isn't going as far what do you say to those folks about the uh, the economy and what's going on well i say we have the best economy in the world we got to make it better we really do have the best economy in the world jobs are up more than they've ever been we're in a situation where the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years is maintained we have people who just but people that, look I think we're going to find out that what happened as a consequence of the crisis we had in health is have a lasting effect. And we just got to get people to move again. We're we're ready. I mean, I think the country's ready to come together in a way that I've never, I I mean that sincerely. I'm, I'm truly optimistic. Okay. So the question was about cost of living and he immediately goes to we've got the greatest economy in the world. And he does it again and again and again. Yeah. I mean, what the hell? By the way, that crashing sound you hear is the president, ardent listener of the podcast, throwing yet another iPhone across the uh, oval because <laughs> uh, he is dug in on this Irish stubbornness, which I know well. <laughs> he he just wants to grab him by the lapels. And by the way, if, if, if you know, all political consultants know when you work for incumbents, you always have this conversation because every incumbent has already written the first ad and they hand it to you on a scrap of paper, which is here are the 28 things I've done for you, you sons of bitches. You owe me your vote. <laughs> and that's the spot they always want. You have to pry it out of their their mind. And Biden's not letting go of thinking he can jawbone people into thinking it's a better economy. And it is a big mistake. I hope he's not left in November repeating the words of the immortal Big Bill Thompson, mayor of Chicago in the 1920s, when he lost and said, the people have spoken, the dirty bastards. <laughs> I voted for Big Bill Johnson. But is, so is the is the answer to this? I mean, I, I, David, your answer to this is what is to basically you have to grant the premise on some level, which is yes, we're not there yet. Well, and the thing is, it's but 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 can you do you have to be specific about this one thing, right? Because the reality here is that you know whenever every president who's got uh, the unemployment rates going down, but in truth. It's a number. And if you don't have a job and now you do have a job, that affects you. But most people have jobs. The GDP growth doesn't matter. The, all right. of these things are just big aggregate numbers. Stock market. Yeah. Here's the thing that affects absolutely every single person, rich, yes. poor, middle class, yes. which is cost of eggs, cost of gas. Those things are still too high. Does, does Your view is Biden has to basically say, look. The difference is, of course, rich people don't have to worry about the cost of eggs. Of but course. most people do. And I think you know, here's, <laughs> they're actually rich because they do worry about the cost of yeah. stuff. But keep Can going. I just have one minute? to just to vent as I do. This is therapy for me, okay? <laughs> Joe Biden is supposed to be the guy from Scranton. Mr. Empathy. Okay, this is what Scranton, people in Scranton are talking about. Uh, and this is 
you have to link up with people where they are. I mean, we learned that lesson in the Obama campaign when we we, we crowed about our economic achievements when people were still feeling the effects of the Great Recession. And it, it, and what we ultimately figured out is we got to be on their side. And it's fine to say, listen, in many ways, the economy is so much better than it was when we got here. Uh, and you can quickly list those. But that's not how people experience it. When you go to the supermarket, when you go, when you pay your rent, when you go to the gas station, that's how you experience the economy. And that's not working for people right now. And it's not working for these reasons. And then I think I'd go right after, you know, I'd go after sort of the the corporate bad guys and so on for price gouging and which they're doing, by the way, they have all these things going, but they're not really highlighting them. They do one-offs on going after the big grocers for raising prices far more than their costs and blaming the rece- uh, blaming the pandemic. You know, they they go after uh, rent the price gouging on rents. Justice Department is, but they don't. That it's a one-off, and I, that's where he should be going. Put yourself on the side of people. Class warfare, damn it, it built the Democratic oh, Party. God. Yes, hey, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I just want to say, uh, Axelrod, I just, uh, the Murphy uh, on, on the regular sends me uh, a, a, a screenshot of a headline uh, from Politico back in January, which said, uh, Joe Biden called David Axelrod a prick. It won't shut him up. And I was going to say, this is, this is, that's, this, this is QED. Right I'm here. trying to help. QED right here. I'm trying to help. I am sending you, did I give you a, a pricks for Biden campaign button? <laughs> no, I don't have that yet. I want one. I qualify. Yeah. You got, you don't have one, Murphy? No, no. All come right. on. I, I've sent you all that EV merch. Come on. I have a, a tranche of them sitting in up. front of me on my desk. They'll be in the. Better have a union bug. Murphy's going to run the motor pool for that organization. Could we'll fill it all with the EV cars and uh, and I'll be the treasurer. I can, uh, I can do a lot of embezzlement. I can do a lot of Time embezzlement. Time to organize. Uh, but look, I, let me just say, I don't agree with some of this stuff ideologically, but as a matter of politics, God, why he can't start where people are, which is stuff costs too much. And then say, we're doing the hard work. And the question is, as we land this thing in the economy, does get better. Whose side is who on? Trump's right. on his side. I'm on your side. A hundred percent. That's what you have to pick here. Who's going to land the plane and on what runway? Runway for working people or the Donald Trump, you know, runway, which is not about you. The run with the runway for Donald Trump, runway for Donald Trump. This should be center cut for Joe Biden. Center cut. This is what helped win 2020. It wasn't the soul of America. Yes, people wanted more decency and they wanted more calm. Empathy. But it was also, but it was empathy. And, and, and I understand I you. What you're going through. I understand exactly. your I, I feel your pain. Yeah. No, it's it's Clinton. I feel your pain. I know when you look at that grocery scanner every week and you see a bigger number and you wonder what the hell happened. You better have an answer for that, or they can always get a new president. Trump's argument is, uh, and I've said this before, Trump's argument is the world's out of control, Biden's not in command. Biden's argument should be, I'm fighting for you, Trump's fighting for himself. Exactly. And this exactly. fits right into uh right into that. But instead is is saying is you're wrong about the problems. We're doing great. And I'm gonna take a nap now because I'm old and I don't get it. The deadly attack on Biden is gonna be he's too old to get the economy. He's out of touch. You know, and that is that's gonna cut. The question is, does his pride overcome his ju- the better judgment here? So far, not. Okay, then let's take a break right here, and we'll be right back. Father's Day, Mother's Day, you don't want to send the lame, easy gift. It's a special day for special people. You want to do something unique, something they will remember. So guess what? We've cracked the code here at Hacks on Tap. You know, we are art lovers here at this political podcast. Axelrod has a collection of Elvis uh, memorabilia, and Gibbs is a sad clown guy. Me, I'm more Picasso and, and that sort of thing. But hey, to each his own. Well, guess what I did for Father's Day? I commissioned some art, and you ought to see this thing. It's an incredible portrait of me. Let's just say tigers are involved. I have kind of a Buffalo Bill outfit. Well, if you're lucky, we may tweet it. Well, how did I do that? How did I give uh, my father such incredible art that he's uh, he's already completely uh, excited about? Well, 
I found it at Paint Your Life. Because with Paint Your Life, you will have, just like I did, a hand-painted portrait created to fit almost any budget. And I'll tell you, it is a great gift idea for your mother or father, or even both, a matching set. Believe me, it is unforgettable stuff that they will really enjoy. Again, it's professional. It's hand-painted. It's a portrait. And it's created from any photo. And it's all done at a truly affordable price. An unforgettable Mother or Father's Day gift. All you got to do is upload photos to create anything you imagine. You can add a little artistic license like I did. Put yourself in a location, the Oval Office, the King of England, whatever you want to be. And you've got lots of options. You choose an artist, you know, that way you pick the style, the art medium, oil, acrylic, watercolor, charcoal, or more, and an incredible selection of quality frames. It's a very user-friendly platform. It lets you order a custom-made hand-painted portrait, get this, in less than five minutes. And you can communicate directly with your artist to make sure the portrait is painted just like you dream. So get a hand-painted portrait in as little as two weeks, the perfect birthday, anniversary, or Mother or Father's Day gift, or both. It's meaningful, it's personal, and it's heartwarming. It's the gift that'll warm your mother and father's heart. You may even catch them wiping away your tear or two. With my portrait, it was gales of choking laughter. But hey, to each his own. My art style is a little unique, and I can tell you that PaintYourLife.com did an incredible job with this thing, and I'm going to tweet it eventually. So, Here's the offer just for Hackaroos. You can give the most meaningful gift you have ever given at paintyourlife.com. And there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, get 20% off your painting. That's right. You think Rembrandt put it on sale like that? No, but we got you a deal at paintyourlife.com. 20% off and free shipping. So to get this special offer, Text the word HACKS, the magic word HACKS, to 87204. That's HACKS to 87204. Text HACKS to 87204. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. Last question that also came up in my session with Pluff and Rove was, should Biden debate? Pluff was very, very strong on he has to, he needs to. Where was Carl? Yeah, what did the Rovers say? Carl said he thought that the debates would be decisive. And Carl made the point, which is absolutely right, was it's less how it's less what people say than how they say it in that debate. Yeah, and if Biden, that. if Biden holds up, then, uh, you know, that would be his stress test. Uh, and so the thing is that Biden has said, when asked about this, we'll see how he behaves. Now, as I pointed out there, if that is the test, he's he's not biting. <laughs> There's no debate. Though somebody will be losing, there will be a debate, I think, they're wanted. But it, I would amend what Pluff said. It's really important that Biden have a good debate. Not really important he debates. Well, I think what Pluff's saying is that he needs to he needs to do it. To pass the test. Right. I totally agree with that. Like Reagan in 80, just to put it in parlance that you yeah. relate to, Murphy. Or like the State of the Union and, and, and like what he had to do in the State of the Union. There's like these basic performance tests. Like I, you right. know, I mean, I know you guys talked about this on the on the podcast, but it's like, you know, the State of the Union was a big deal. It was a big deal because a lot of people were like, you know, Joe Biden, but he's going to basically be like a cadaver up yeah, there. Exactly. He got up there, wasn't a cadaver. It didn't matter what he said. It didn't matter how he said it. It didn't matter that he went too fast. It didn't matter that he, and none of it mattered. All that mattered was that like, that dude was like, he oh, stood hey, the ring for 15 he's not rounds. a cadaver. He's not drooling on his shirt. Great. Yeah. yeah. And he knew who he was and he was right. not out of his mind wandering around calling people by the wrong name. He exceeded expectations. One thing that he will benefit from in a debate is low expectations. Well, and also just think back to 2020 when they debated. The debate, the first debate was one of the great shit shows of our time. And right. the honest to God truth is that they both were terrible in it. But the truth was Biden didn't seem like a lunatic. So it was kind of like he ended up winning that debate, not because he was particularly good at it, but just because he was able to stand up there on stage and watch Trump like fulminate, you know, and do all his kind of craziness. It was seen as a win for Biden. I think that could happen again. I mean, Trump, It's this is a place where... There's this thing, you know, the the liberal talking point, which is Trump is 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 diminished mentally. 
Biden is diminished mentally, uh, but but people only pay attention to Biden and Trump is worse and all that. And there even there's some truth to that. But the reality is that like in this setting is when you could actually benefit from that, where yeah. Biden being no one's going to care if Biden stammers a little bit, stutters a little bit. Trump's sweating, red faced, raving. Well, and think about where Trump's head might be at that point. Bonkers. He may be convicted. We don't know whether he'll have been tried on the January 6th thing. But this is not just about winning election for Trump. This is like about staying out of jail. It's about staying out of jail. Yeah. So uh, there'll be a, an element of desperation there that uh, might come into into play. Well, we'll see whether that happens. Uh, maybe on both sides, because Trump, uh, Biden, uh, with this economic message, could still be losing. So yeah, for sure. Two desperate old guys, you know, but again, he's uh, got to get off that man to win. Biden needs a good debate. That is like golden rule of gravity of the campaign. And they ought to start working on that every single day. I'm sure they're thinking about it. You know, I don't know if they have any confidence in them when they punted on the Super Bowl interview. Yes. The easiest thing yes. in the world to do. A, a, a really good chimp could get through that. And and they were afraid to do that. That means there's a good day and bad. Something's going on on the staff level that makes them really afraid of their guy being out there. And I think it's an illusion for them to think they have a choice. Here's a great Hacks on Tap real insider thing. Ooh, deep, deep yeah. insider thing. What? See, Rogan doesn't have any of this. What does it mean, David, to Biden's ability to debate to have to do debate prep probably without Ryan Klein? Well... There are other people who are good at debate I know. prep. I know. Karen Dunn. There are people who've learned it. Ron Kelly. There's great debate prep people. But Ron Klain's been every Biden debate prep forever, and he's the best one ever. Yeah, he's 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 great. Uh, we had Klain and Tom Donilon back in uh, 2008, uh, Tom being very close to Biden as well. Look, I think that you want him to be comfortable in that debate prep, but you also and you also need people who don't want him to be too comfortable and aren't willing to tell him uh, what he needs to do. Exactly. Uh, maybe change it up. But I, I've been through debate. I've been yeah. through a couple of debate preps with Biden. You know, it's a he he has his own way of doing things. And uh, David's also been through a couple of debate preps with Barack Obama, who wasn't always the easiest to get through a debate prep. Well, to be honest, nobody it, debate prep is a pain in the neck, but. Listen, Obama was he was mostly better than anybody I've ever dealt with on that. So, um, well, you know who is really great at debate prep? The late Joe Lieberman, who I think oh, we're going to do. How's that wow. for a transition? Segway. Yeah. I just like Joe. I did a speech gig with him about a year ago. He was sharp on top of it. And he was appalled. This is the thing people don't know about Lieberman. He loved to talk campaign stuff and old campaigns. He was a total junkie for it. He actually wrote a book about a famous Connecticut political boss. Uh, and he was a good guy with a strong compass who didn't mind taking heat. And he was damn hard to beat in an election. So I just respected him on a lot of levels. And uh, the only thing we disagreed on was this no labels madness. But uh, he, he argued that case with verve and, and charm. And it just breaks my heart because he was so sharp and had so much left to give that Literally, a, 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 an accident out of nowhere uh, ended a full life of public service early. So I just wanted to give a little salute out to uh, the late, great Joe Lieberman. He was one of the most delightful people, truly. I mean, yes. put aside his, his stances on any given issues or whatever, and the left hates him and blah, blah, blah. Just as a reporter who talked to him a lot over the course of many years, he was like one of the just most delightful, kind, nice yeah true-hearted like public servant funny, funny yeah uh, observant i mean he would he could he could tell a great story uh sometimes on the record sometimes off he was just a really good dude and you could be like i disagree with him on a lot of things but i always thought it was never i never didn't learn something from talking to him and i never didn't felt like he was he was ever anything other than just generous with his time and 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 and, and really in the game for the right reason yeah you mentioned never losing an election he back back in uh in 2006, you'll remember, was in deep trouble because Democrats uh, were in, angry about his support, his strong support for the war in Iraq. Is that the Ned Lamont election? That was the Ned Lamont yes, election? And I, and yes, and a young Barack Obama, Senator Obama, went up there, you'll remember, to campaign for him. He went to a party dinner to campaign for Lieberman, at which Lieberman was booed, and Obama stuck up for Lieberman and—, and, uh, and you know, the anti-war 
folks were angry Mad. at him for yes. uh, for for doing it. The thing is that after the after the nomination, Obama endorsed Lamont, as did most Democrats, uh, and Lieberman was angry about that, and he was angry. Um, I, I think in some ways it liberated him. In other ways, I don't think he ever got over the fact that uh, people who he was close to walked away from him uh, after he lost that nomination. And, uh, and you know, I think it in some ways got it. He didn't endorse uh, Obama in 2008 because his friend John McCain was running, spoke at the Republican convention, also didn't inv- endorse him in 2012. This close to being John McCain's running mate. I this knew close. I liked him. This close. But a boom. I want to uh, just before we wrap it up here, one other plug. And I'm going to break our golden rule of selfishness here and plug another podcast. But our friend, the oh, no. holster, Zach McCrary, has a great podcast called Pro Politics. X and I have you must have been it, on it, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, yes, 15. You eventually came around, too. You've been on it, right? I demanded it. I said, if you had Murphy, you have yeah, to have right. me. Yeah, right. Equal time. Anyway, there. if you are a fan of old school Texas politics, he's got Ken Hans on uh, the last episode. One of the great storytellers, Reagan stories. And I, I won't go into a long Ken Hans. I work for him in one of his races. It's a great podcast. People talk about working in politics in their career. But the Hans one is if you're any kind of political junkie and, and you, you love the old school Texas stuff, uh, you, you got to listen to this episode. It, it'll get you hooked on it. And it boy, is it fun to listen to Ken Hans, a legendary congressman from West Texas who originally beat a young George W. Bush in his first race and went on to being all over the Reagan stuff, switch parties, Dem to R. Anyway, it, it's uh, it's really worth it. What's the hacks on tap big on the uh, on the ad revenues for that podcast? You guys are obviously in the tank for this thing. Yeah, there's uh, some money coming in from this for you guys. Yeah, yeah, we we got some crumpled bills, Chicago stuff. But either that or it goes right into Murphy's pocket, which may be he's got he's he's got a young child. He needs it. I understand. They're supporting my charity, Californians Against Seal Hunting, or Cash. You can just write out <laughs> your check for that. We're doing important work. Okay, let's take a break right here for a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Murphy, I know for a fact, although I can't tell you which, that I have subscriptions that I never look at that renew automatically that ultimately would add up to a number that would make my head explode if I ever looked into it. And you must have the same. No, totally. I mean, in your case, I know that TrotskyLadies.com isn't cheap. And every time I look at my credit card bill, I find out some bad decision from three years ago. It turns out to be a nine ninety five a month subscription deal. And it drives me crazy because, you know, I can't track it all. What do I do? You go to Rocket Money is what you do because Rocket Money will cancel a subscription for you uh, that uh, was otherwise time consuming. It, it'll alert you to an increase in subscription price or negotiate it for you. Uh, it, it'll do all kinds of things. Did you know nearly 75% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about? like you and me. You know, I've had friends who use Rocket Money who, like me, thought they had four or five subscriptions and they end up having 12. They couldn't believe it when uh, they were showed they were paying for 12 subscriptions every month between streaming services, fitness apps, and delivery services. You know, brother, it's never ending. And thanks to Rocket Money, they're no longer wasting money on the ones they forgot about. Yeah, you know, we all struggle with finding time to manage our finances because it's a grind. And all I did was on an airplane napkin, I figured, all right, I've got to have five, six, seven of these things that I can't remember at six or seven bucks a month. Before I knew it, it's six, seven hundred dollars a year that's just yeah. bleeding away to the, the tricky uh, subscription magnates. And I said, enough. So I'm glad Rocket Money's joined us because I've got it now and I'm going to dig in. It's a simple thing. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels all your unwanted subscriptions. I mean, this is perfect work for a computer because it's drudgery, but the computer is accurate. It can hunt them down. It can cancel the unwanted one, and it monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills because when you start multiplying these things times 12 months a year, it It's real money. With Rocket Money, you have full control over your subscriptions and a clear view of your expenses. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place. And if you see something you don't want, you get rid of it. Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. You're going to love how the dashboard shows you this month's spending compared to last month. So you can clearly see your spending habits. Plus, they'll help you create a custom budget and keep your spending on track. 
Yeah, you look, Rocket Money will even try to negotiate lower bills for you. You just take a camera phone pick of a bill and the Rocket Money brilliant computer takes it from there. And this thing works. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's powerful features. I mean, there's real money involved, so get with it. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel those unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash hacks. That's rocketmoney.com slash hacks. Rocketmoney.com slash hacks. All right, if you have a mailbag question, just email it to us at hacksontap at gmail.com, hacksontap at gmail.com, or we got all fancy, and now we have a phone number where you can leave us a voicemail. We're doing it on the air. Just use your name and try to keep it around 25 seconds, okay? We're we're not doing a two-hour pod here. I can never remember the number, so they made me record it. 773-389-389. 4471. I'll repeat it because who can remember that? 773 389 4471. Is that a Murphy AI right there? That was there's no way that was a human. There's no way that was a human reading that thing. But we should point out to our listeners that if you want to have your question answered, you got a better shot if you come in through the voicemail than if you send it in by email because we're of course a audio production here so it makes yeah, things... nobody can remember the numbers so we only get a couple of voicemails so yes. we're almost forced seven eight nine four five three <laughs> nine two one one i sound like ramona lemmy somebody email us if you know who ramona <laughs> lemmy was a great trivia question first question for brother axelrod this is from kenny and it's voicemail hey guys it's kenny in san diego if you were advising the biden campaign What strategies would you suggest to boost African-American turnout and support? Thanks a lot. It's a great question, Kenny. And uh, I think it's probably one that is absorbing a lot of brain power over at the Biden campaign right now, because as we've mentioned here before, if you look at poll after poll, Trump is doing better among African-Americans than Biden can afford uh, right now, uh, polling in the between 20 and 20 as high as 24 or 5 in some polls, that is unacceptable. That can't happen. If that happens, he'll be elected president. So now the question is whether that's real. Bakari Sellers was on the show last week, and he said that uh, he thought the real contest was between Biden and the couch, not Biden and Trump. But either way, Biden needs those votes. He got 88 percent 87, 88 percent of the African-American vote in the last election. And that's going to be the key in some battleground states. Uh, and I think that uh, two things. One is I think a lot the, they have to make the, it's young black men who are uh, peeling away most uh, readily. And I think economic arguments are uh, going to be very, very important there. And I think comparative is very important there. Uh, I think comparative, frankly, is the way they have to run this whole campaign. I don't think uh, selling people on uh, the uh, on the beneficence or whatever of the Democratic Party is going to carry the day. Uh, they need to understand the choice and what the implications are on the economy, uh, maybe on criminal justice issues, maybe on uh, uh, education uh, and uh, student loans, they need a basket of issues, but it needs to be in a comparative frame so uh, people feel like they have a stake in the choice, not just a stake in Joe Biden or the Democratic Party. Mike, I'm going to give you a question from a guy named Mike. Oh, it's going to be good. Mike wants to know from Mike, why do third party efforts always seem to focus on the presidency where they have no realistic electoral prospect except spoilers? Wouldn't a Congress focused effort make more sense? Yeah, so what normally happens when you have a wrong track election, where most people think things are seriously off on the wrong track and they're all grumpy, you have a bunch of people who kind of want to vote against politics as usual. So that's when these independent things get kind of attractive, at least for a while. You know, you had Ross Perot, kind of a populist revolt. You had John Anderson, a wine and cheese 
liberal Republican revolt in 1980. So here we are, wrong track election. People don't like politics. They don't like the two choices. So it's fertile ground for one of these things. Now, often they fall apart late, by the way, uh, but they can still have in the right places an impact that's normally a spoiler. So, yeah, I, I think it's kind of silly to focus on the presidency. Well, what about, but but the question he asked is, what about third-party efforts on... Yeah, yeah, no, I'm winding around races. to it. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this Axelrod right. style. I'm running all four bases here. I'm double parked, so hurry up, will you? Um, it's, uh, yeah, you, you got to move to a safe location because <laughs> Biden's already sent out the ninjas. Uh, so, you know, there might be a few congressional places where it's a better area to test it. I mean, Joe Lieberman, who we talked about, uh, ran an independent campaign uh, successfully uh, for the Senate. So it's a better idea to try it in Congress, but it's generally hard. We're in a Coke Pepsi system now. Now, once we might have voting on mobile phones and all the you know, jets and stuff for the future democracy, that might break down some barriers. Though, having worked around the world, including in multi-party places, you know, careful what you wish for. There's a certain focusing effect of our two-party system, but it definitely it's a waste on the presidential level, and it can, can lead to stupid spoiler things, and I think Biden faces that threat this year. Did you guys see that Bobby Kennedy clip when he was on uh, that, that out of his mind know, on uh, on Aaron Burnett the other night when he was like no no was I, like, I I I missed that I had family and what happened it, it, she she basically said do you th- is, do you think there's really any argument that 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 Joe Biden is as great a threat to American democracy as Donald Trump and, and Bobby Kennedy was like I can make that argument I can make that argument he's I mean like. I, I just haven't seen him be quite as nakedly anti, just like the, this is so uh, nakedly anti Biden, like not like a, the, the the idea that Trump, just to see him like kind of on television saying this thing about that's I mean I know whatever you think about Biden. Listen for the Biden people. I think uh, I think the more he plays to the Trump constituency, the better. You know they need to strip away these young people who are attracted to him by his anti corporatism and by climate and so on. All right, bat and clean up here for John from Ellen. If Trump loses in November, how will his power over the party change? Will ours still feel the same need to bow down to him? It seems like there are a fair number of ours that are tired of living in fear of his retribution if they disagree with his insane ideas. What say you? Well, I say first that if Donald Trump loses in, in November, the first thing that will happen is though he'll try to stage an insurrection. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and then if the insurrection fails, uh, he's probably going to end up in jail. There's no doubt that a a jailed, d- defeated Donald Trump is over as a as a as a personal kingmaker in the Republican Party. I think that fear of retribution has really never been the main issue with Trump. The main issue with Trump is that people in the party are afraid of Trump's voters. And the party has become magnified by, it's a process that started before Trump, and Trump uh, accelerated it and then ca- kind, of, uh, uh, kind of consolidated it. You know, will people in the Republican Party still be afraid of the MAGA base, that there are people, that that, that those voters who love Trump are still out there? And will the kind of voters, who, the, kind of the, the normal Republicans, will they still be afraid of their own voters, I think they will still be afraid of their own voters. Donald Trump, though, if he loses, will be a completely, I think, a tight, he will not be a force any longer in American politics if he loses and then fails in his effort to try to steal another election. I agree. Ag- agreement? I agree. Wait, agreement? Does, does Murphy, I what do you I think agree. about that? No, he'll be think- a husk. He'll be washed up, two-time loser. No, 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 of course. Listen, I think his problems are, his, he's going to have, you know, he has other, he's going to have a lot other problems other than leading the Republican Party if he loses this election. I, I've always felt this election was his. Yeah, he's going to find out that in the in the can, hairspray costs more than a few cigarettes. It's going to be a hard time for him. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I've always felt that this was his that this was his um, legal defense strategy was running for president again. That was uh, like a big part of what he was out to do. So I don't think the Republican Party. I think his constituency will live, and there will be others who will try and grab a hold of it, and there'll be a fight as to who the new generation leader is of that movement. Uh, and I'm not sure anybody can replicate what Trump has done, but uh, I don't think uh, that he is going to, having lost again and facing all the legal peril he has, is going to continue to be the leader of the Republican Party. All right. There we go. Johnny Heilman, thank you. It's great to see you, brother. You, you got to come back more often. I mean, how many invitations do we have to extend? 
Well, it, it, Murphy just somehow for conveniently loses my number. Just every, <laughs> basically every time after I've seen him, this will be all about six months from now. I'll be like, I requested you this week. I'm your only friend. Never forget <laughs> that. And I'm going to call you about EVs. Uh, we're going to we're going to sort that out. I look at you. I think Rivian. Yeah, I was going to say, is Rivian okay? You're calling him about okay. ED? What, 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 what are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, about? he calls me about that. Uh, EVs, <laughs> okay. electric oh, vehicles. EVs, yes, yes. EVpolitics.org, yes. America, join the movement. But yeah, I'm happy to hear it, Johnny. Whenever I'm feeling flaccid, Mike's my first phone call. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> All right, now we absolutely have to go. Yeah, no, let's get out of here. All right, see you, pal. All right, okay, see, see you later, guys. Bye.